welcome to another fabulous conversation for the Millionaires Magazine and the Millionaires Movement. I'm Amanda Jane Clarkson, Editor-in-Chief, and today I'm delighted to be joined by seasoned entrepreneur and founder, CEO of Collective Hub, Lisa Messenger. Lisa, Lisa launched Collective Hub as a print magazine in 2013 with no experience in an industry that people said is either dead or dying, right? Collective Hub has since grown into an international multimedia business and lifestyle platform with multiple verticals across print, digital events and co-working spaces, all of which serve to ignite human potential. Lisa is an international speaker, a best-selling author, and an authority on disruption in both the corporate sector and the startup scene. Lisa's experience in publishing has seen her produce over 400 custom published books for companies and individuals, as well as having authored and co-authored 16 herself, if not more. Lisa is a regular commentator on business, entrepreneurialism and wellness. And her vision is to build a community of like-minded people who want to change the world, beautifully aligned with our mission. Welcome, Lisa. <laughs> and thanks for being part of the Millionaires Movement and Magazine. Uh, thank you so much for having me. It's really beautiful to be here with you. Oh, thank you. And what a story, hey, at such a young age, you've done so much and uh, what an amazing journey so far. So how did all a journey. <laughs> <laughs> I've had 14 businesses and I'm in my 50s, so don't worry, I get the journey. <laughs> yeah, wow, 14, that's impressive. Oh, yeah, still going. And um, so what about your journey to where you are now? How did it actually begin? Oh, which bits do you want to know about? My goodness. And how, and how raw do you want to go? Uh, well, so oh, well, as long as you want to go for whatever you feel that is valuable for our ladies to hear. Well, in terms of business, I started my first business on the 22nd of October, 2001. My my fiancé laughs at me because I, I have a great propensity for remembering dates and I'm, he says I'm the only person that? who celebrates every single various anniversary over the years. I have many of them in my mind. Um, yeah, so it did that. And then it really took me, I often say, kind of 11 years to truly step into finding my purpose and a lot of business owners or people wanting to do big things in their life will relate to this and so it's okay you know great things take time off and so for the first 11 years I kind of had what I call an integrated marketing agency and I was kind of uh, helping people with branding, custom publishing, and a number of other things. But it wasn't a terribly smart way to run a business in terms of um, I was kind of being everything to everyone, didn't have a lot of systems and processes in place. But, you know, I did okay. So I, I invested in a lot of property through that time because the business became quite profitable over the years. It just wasn't exciting me that much. I felt like I was kind of going, you know, day in and day out following a bit the same old, same old. And so I was surrounded by a lot of extraordinary entrepreneurs and a lot of amazing women and thought leaders. And so in 2012, I came up with this crazy idea which you can relate to uh, to start a magazine and <laughs> it was crazy as you said in my introduction because I'd never worked in the media and I'd never worked for magazines I mean I'd been doing custom publishing of books but in comparison they were quite one-dimensional <laughs> and a lot easier and but I had this burning desire to create a platform and a medium where I could tell the story behind the story and and you you will relate to this like making it relatable and attainable and real and raw. I felt like so many of the media were portraying, you know, this is Amanda and she's amazing. And I was always like, but how did she do it? Why did she do it? Like, what's the supply chain? Um, how did she fund it? And so really I started Collective Hub as a print magazine to kind of tell that story. And what is extraordinary, I think, and have come to believe to know to be true, is when you truly step into your purpose, sometimes the synchronicity and the serendipity and what happens as a result is quite extraordinary. So I kind of bet the farm, put everything into that magazine. But yes, within 18 months, it was in 37 countries. And I had people like Anna Wintour, one day I had an email, literally in the subject line, it just said from the office of Anna Wintour. And it was like, 
you know, it was from one of her three PAs and they said she would like to meet with you. So I flew to New York and met with Anna and, you know, anyway, many, many, many stories about what happened next. <laughs> yeah, it got pretty big pretty fast. That's amazing. Oh, congratulations. Take us back to that moment when the email came in. Okay, come on, tell us what you did. You had, did you have a happy dance or what did you do? <laughs> well, I did. And I mean, I think this is the, also the important thing. Like, it's so funny because I almost went from being, you know, in obscurity to overnight kind of, I don't know, well, the magazine suddenly being the hottest thing on everyone's lips and everyone, my inbox suddenly, you know, inundated. And when I launched, and you will know about this, I just never even thought about being an editor because I'd never been in that world. And suddenly I started getting invited to like all these A-lister events or red carpet events with actual editors who'd been around for years and years. And so, yeah, when that email from Anna's office came through, I was like, wow, you know, this is a real moment of, you know, pinch me anything's possible because literally 18 months earlier I'd never you know been in a room with anyone from a magazine like I just didn't know that world I mean I guess I'd been on the other side of the media and been interviewed a lot and I'm very grateful for that but yeah so what happened was um everyone said to me what are you gonna wear like that was the first thing right it's kind of winter (laughs) and my message around that I mean of course I had a stylist and (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> helped me to prepare but a really important message around that and I think this is where success largely comes from is people often make themselves feel less than in a situation like that and I needed to remember that she actually asked to have a business meeting with me because Collective Hub had gotten on her radar and you know she was and still is arguably like the doyen of publishing globally you know Condé Nast and Vogue and everything else and Collective grew so quickly and we had you know I had like Ryan Gosling on the cover and I had Sarah Jessica Parker and like a lot of you know very very well-known people in a very short period of time and we also were not just doing print but we were doing digital and events and I was doing things from a revenue perspective quite differently so I had gotten on her radar she had asked to meet with me and it was bizarre because I got to New York I went to the Condé Nast um, offices um, you know on the site of the World Trade Center that was and across the hallway um, it was a glass boardroom Um, Grace Coddington you know the one with the hair is sitting on the phone and I felt like I was in the Devil Wears Prada or the September issue and I was like (laughs) can this be actually happening and it was really extraordinary and Chuck Townsend who was at the time Anna's boss and the chairman of Condé Nast um he then actually wrote me a testimonial for the front cover of my first book in this series called Daring and Disruptive. So, yeah, it was it was amazing. And I had conversations with Conan Nast about licensing Collective Hub into the US and going under their, um, their brand. And I didn't do that. And that's a whole other story for, right, <laughs> for maybe right. another day or for now um, about why I didn't. But it was actually Chuck who dissuaded me because I was like, oh, my, my ego was like on fire. I was like, this is amazing. Like they want little of me from Australia to be part of that brand. And it was actually Chuck, after I met with Anna, I sat in his office and he was, he's just the most beautiful man and he's continued to support and, you know, mentor me over the years. But he said, don't do it, which was a huge lesson because um, he said, you'll be sort of stuffed into a a corner and it will become all about um, numbers and, you know, KPIs and it will all be data driven. Whereas part of the reason Collective Hub did what it did in such a short period of time was I wasn't I didn't have to conform and I wasn't boxed into a particular situation it was me and it was 100% funded somewhat crazily (laughs) by me and uh yeah so I didn't I didn't go down that track which is interesting (laughs) there's a couple of golden nuggets you touched on then uh you talked about your ego and conformity And, you know, really thinking about is it right for your mission and the vision that you had for Collective Hub? It is a very, very valuable lesson you just shared there. Mm, Thank you. And I know a lot of your wonderful community will also attest to these situations. And it's tricky, you know. I think when we start anything and a big, you know, bright, shiny opportunity comes at us, I've seen, and I've also been guilty of this myself, I've seen way too many people just jump at that without thinking, as you so rightly said, about the greater mission, vision, values, you know, purpose. And so, you know, that was a tricky decision because on one hand there was 
ego and oh my gosh little old me being part of something so extraordinary on a global level and then there was I am loving doing this so much part of the reason that it's working is and and Matthew Stanton in Australia was the CEO of Bauer at the time so he had 80 magazines plus under his jurisdiction and he used to have breakfast with me every three or so months and he would say to me my god how are you doing this like you know they had much bigger mags than me yet I had floor to ceiling light walls at every single um, airport in Australia you know I'd done all these deals and the thing is that I used to say to Matthew it's because Um, I can duck and weave, I'm nimble, I'm flexible, I can pivot, you know, I can adapt. As an entrepreneur who owns the um, it in its entirety and I can disrupt and I can do things differently and I can buck the status quo, whereas the big guys like a Condé Nast or a Bauer, um, you know, or any of those, and this is the same for any industry, it takes a lot of red tape and bureaucracy and time to actually move through things. And so, I, I decided, rightly or wrongly, in hindsight, to maintain 100% equity <laughs> and ownership, and it helped me to continue to grow. And then, which we can talk about, it also then got very difficult. And, you know, hindsight, potentially, I could have done things a little bit differently, but we can dig into that. As we all can as entrepreneurs, and we all second guess ourselves and question ourselves, did I make the wrong decision? Did I write the, make the right decision? But in that moment, that was clearly the right uh, decision for you. You must have had a reason. In hindsight, looking back, if you had that opportunity again, would your decision have been different? It wouldn't, that decision wouldn't have been different because what happened was, and, and many people listening to watching this will relate I think when we start any brand it's um it's very exciting we can move really fast you know it's all about passion and owning the brand 100% at the time was great because it enabled me to just break rules every single day I was breaking rules and doing things differently and no one was there to stop me but the thing is I scaled extraordinarily quickly so I literally went from three staff to 34 full-time staff you know in a matter of months and um and I had so suddenly I had three and a half million dollars in fixed salaries and actually of the 34 staff only three of them were um writers or um an editor and the rest of my staff were all freelance so I had, um, you know, sometimes up to almost 300 people working for me globally. So it became a very, very big, um, (laughs) you know, multi, multi, multi multi-million dollar business very quickly. And the interesting thing about that is you don't know what you don't know until you're there. And I would say I'm a great founder and I'm a great visionary and leader. I'm not necessarily a great CEO and I'm not necessarily, well, I'm definitely not great. (laughs) It doesn't come naturally like the operations side. So, you know, systems, processes, um, legal, HR, IT. And that's what happens a lot. If you're a creative, it's hard to wear both hats. And running a business across 37 countries and multiple platforms was suddenly, you know, pretty big. So um, so I pulled in um, a CFO and a COO but, and, uh, <laughs> and many big O's. <laughs> Um, but it was all it was almost too late so in hindsight I possibly would have brought in financial and strategic investors a little earlier on just to help me navigate kind of the the magnitude of the business yeah so which I wasn't prepared for but you know hindsight now is a wonderful wonderful thing because it's only having gone there that now my businesses are so systemized structured um you know we slice and dice data within an inch of its life and whilst I'm primarily a creative I'm very much you know intimate with my data and my numbers and my P&Ls my spreadsheets my cash flow my forecasting like all of that is an imperative now because I now have you know multiple businesses across multiple countries and yeah that's the only way to actually grow and sustain you know profitable um, productive efficient businesses you you know one thing I'm, I'm getting from this conversation is that you've stayed humble throughout all of this through the highs significant lows as I've gone through myself uh, as an entrepreneur you've stayed um, authentic and humble and I think that's really important in today's society where we wear all these masks and personas, we've got the social side of things. What would you say about 
the importance of being authentic in business and keeping that humbleness, that humility. Thank you. Um, I'd say it's a lot. Thank you. I'd say it's a lot easier to do than not to do. And this is the great, you know, misnomer, isn't it? Like I think so much of the world these days, particularly in media, social media, you know, influences, a lot of people present this picture perfect, you know, idyllic <laughs> lifestyle. And actually it's quite hard to keep that up. So I kind of err towards the other side where I'm quite self-deprecating and I just tell it how it is. And I find it actually very liberating because it means that I never have any ghosts in the closet. There's nothing that could ever shock me or, you know, anyone else. And whether it's, you know, things that are going on in my business, I'll always talk about, you know, financials or supply chain or, you know, things where I've made silly decisions because I find that that's where we actually empower one another. And also, um, people around me are like, oh, thank God, you're just human as well, you know, and then it becomes relatable and attainable, as I said at the beginning, as opposed to, oh, well, that's Lisa, she's done all these things. Like I'm nothing particularly special really. Even um, I've just taken up a big personal training journey again and, oh, my gosh, I'm training like four times a week with a kick-ass, like, trainer. But <laughs> even like that, I'm not presenting as so many people would, here I am looking fab. I'm like, like yesterday I posted something, I'm like on the ground going, oh, my God, that was the hardest session of my life. And I just think just be you, be true, mm -hmm. be authentic because I think it becomes really hard to keep up a front and as you said before wearing masks and also then I think people almost have to think gosh did I say that to that person did I present like this to that person actually behind the scenes I'm falling apart like it's actually exhausting I think it's much easier just to tell it how it is I couldn't agree more with you and as you grow more, more mature and you have so many more experiences you just can't even be bothered with it this is you know what you see is what you get it is just so hard and I think people more these days appreciate the real and raw side of you especially when you talk about the ups and downs you know entrepreneurship life is just not one-sided. I don't care how many people just try and stay positive. We all have our down days. And I want to talk about your challenges now. I know as an entrepreneur, you've gone through some pull that doona up over your face and not face the world. You know, the shit has, had, has hit the fan in your business or your personal life. Naysay is saying, that's crazy to start a magazine. You don't even know what you're doing, trying to pull your dreams down. Lisa, what do you do to overcome these days and get through or get past the naysayers and the pullers and just get on with living your own dreams? Thank you. Great question. And I think you said it like it's mindset because that's the thing, right? It's not, I mean, I am, I have purposely chosen very consciously years and years ago to, you know, try and live a life of abundance and reciprocity and positivity and optimism. But it doesn't mean that, you know, hard stuff comes at me every single day and not every single day, like every single hour, like the more you put yourself out there and the bigger your life your business becomes people are like oh wow it's so amazing I'm like it is amazing but it comes thick and fast then you know because I'm dealing with a lot of you know money moving around a lot of products moving around so you know supply chain cash flow like all the things that are going on and then life you know like um, my father-in-law unexpectedly passed away eight weeks ago of a heart attack you know like there's stuff that comes at us and they say this there's things that come at us every single day that are beyond our control. So the only thing we can control is our mindset and how we respond. And so over the years, I've done a lot of crazy, wacky therapies <laughs> from, you know, crawling nude through sweat lodges in Costa Rica to, you know, being in wow. um, purple robes in India for three weeks at a time meditating. Like, so I purposefully am counterintuitive and put myself into uncomfortable, very uncomfortable situations quite often that are beyond my westernized, you know, um, norm, just to keep pushing myself to get that resilience and that mindset so that when things come at me I kind of go it's a little like Teflon okay I, I feel that and then I let it slide you know <laughs> or the other thing around mm -hmm. that is um I've surrounded myself with an extraordinary team and I think as entrepreneurs so many of us think we have to do this 
on our own or we're embarrassed or fearful to share. And so over the years, I have hired my weaknesses. So I've got, you know, an amazing bookkeeper, accountant, CFO, got a great lawyer, you know, I've got all these people so that when something happens, rather than hold it and try and deal with it myself, I've trained myself to very quickly go to worst case scenario and then almost reverse engineer it back to current day and then go, right, if I go worst case scenario, who are the people in my circle who can actually help mitigate that risk? So, you know, I'll I'll call one of them, one of my advisors or mentors or, you know, accountant, lawyer, whoever it is. So suddenly I'm not left holding this thing, you know, feeling out of control. Because as a business leader, we have to be able to keep moving forward, you know, just because one bad thing comes at us, we've got to keep moving and growing and focusing on, you know, moving forward and having that forward momentum. So I've learned over the years to uh, harness, harness a positive mindset and mindset flip everything, you know, and get the right support. I love what you're talking about here too is, uh, and this is what I love to talk about a lot, is focus on your own superpowers and either delegate and delete the rest because you can't be everything to everyone. And no. women have this thing that we hold on and try and be super dick and think, oh, I can do everything. <laughs> I can be everything to everyone. But before long, it all crumbs. And uh, I love that you've uh, come full circle really, doing everything yourself and then going, ah, but I'm, I'm similar to you. I just focus on what I love to do these days. And there's superheroes that do things far better than me. I've learned to let it go. And I think that's a big issue with women. Let's talk about that. Letting go of control and then just trusting in not only the universe, but other people. What would you say? What advice can you give other ladies about that? Yeah, so I am the queen of outsourcing. If there's something that I can outsource, I outsource. <laughs> and I mean... Really simple examples going way, way back. I remember like in my early 20s, I used to have a cleaner, right? And people would say back then, oh, my gosh, like how, you know, stuck up are you or how lazy are you or whatever. (laughs) And and I would be like, and and I've maintained that, but to the, the nth degree till now, I'm actually terrible at detail. I'm horrible at it and I don't enjoy it. Whereas there are other people who actually love being detail oriented implementers. Mm -hmm. And so I would rather pay someone for their time. And that hour that I'm paying them, I'm much better off, as you say, stepping into my superpower and doing something that I'm great at and that I love, you know, and I call it being in flow or walking through mud. And so I really check in with myself all the time. Like, does this support my community? Do I feel excited and alive? You know, is is this commercially viable and all those kind of things. And then I'm like, yes, I'm in my sweet spot. But literally, I mean, this year we're putting out 30 something products I think books and um and journals and then we have a whole digital platform and I do a lot of speaking and I have a podcast and a whole lot of stuff across a whole lot of geographic locations and business verticals um and people say to me like god how do you get so much done the way I get so much done is I would call myself a brand architect. I come up with the vision and the idea, but I don't do most of the stuff. Like I have amazing people who do so much of the actual implementation. So it's just me being a visionary and then using, you know, amazing technology such as Asana and there's other ones on the market like Mondays and everything is, you know, written in there so that we all have our to-do list. We all know exactly where we're at. We have, you know, check-ins and pulse checks and, you know, we measure things and have KPIs. But I'm able to run a very, very large global team, all of which, by the way, except my digital content producer are now freelance and they're all over the world. So that's how I do stuff. I outsource everything (laughs) isn't it a wonderful world we live in you know usually we have to travel everywhere even if I was doing these types of uh, conversations you know it wouldn't be anything for us to jump on a plane three or four times and go to America but now we created this global stage and there's so many opportunities that come with the era that we live in Um, if we if we're willing to look ask and let go of needing that control over everything and that's it right it's interesting you say about the travel piece because um 
I do a lot of speaking globally and uh, I was meant to be in Houston in March speaking at a conference and just, it was like just as, you know, COVID hit. And so suddenly we had to, you know, take that keynote speech online and it was an Olympic theme and I had to <laughs> sit in my third bedroom at 1.30 in the morning because that was like the most <laughs> common global time and do this like keynote. But I was thinking about it, I mean, with the same, that was with HP and just a few months before I'd been to Tokyo and that was like five days out of my schedule to go to Tokyo, get on stage for one hour and, you know, go back and forwards. And here yeah. I was 1.30 in the morning while the rest of Australia was sleeping, like doing a keynote to all over the world. And so this year, I feel like, you know, more than ever, silver linings are that we're able to leverage and anyone with a laptop or some tech can work from their kitchen table and create a business or create, you know, a voice in the world. And I think that's a really extraordinary thing. You know, Mm. geography is no longer prohibitive. So I think if one of the many lessons that's come out of 2020 and the year that has been is that. And so many incredible relationships. You know, I get to speak with incredible women all over the world as you do. And it's just, um, it's been uh, you know, an incredible experience and perhaps women I wouldn't have had the opportunity. So it's just how you look at things and view things and we can all make that choice of how we view the world, can't we? Yeah, absolutely. I just want to change um, direction for a moment. You know, we talk about having a CFO, a, a chief financial officer in your business. And uh, I want to talk about the topic of money. So many women will be going, oh, I feel a little bit uncomfortable with that, Amanda. You know, I don't like talking about money. And so <laughs> many people feel that it's a, a taboo subject. I know you don't mind talking about money and money mindfulness. As an entrepreneur, how critically important from your experience do you believe it is to have a healthy mindset around money and and let's dive into talking about money a little bit yeah absolutely it's it's an imperative and you're right in 2014 I wrote a book called money and no 2015 I wrote a book called money and mindfulness and it the notion of that was because so many women in particular won't talk about money and I think so often they're left scratching their head and it's like these behind closed doors conversations around well, how did you afford to buy you know I bought four properties in my 20s like how did you afford to do that or how did you afford to start a magazine that was in 37 countries or how did you and the thing is I didn't have any money. So I talk in that book a lot about how I um, actually made that money, how I started off trading other currencies other than cash in order to start making money. And that entire book is about, um, okay, if you if you don't have things to start with, how can you tap into other like-minded non-competing businesses that might have big databases to help amplify your brand so that actually you start to make revenue? So I talk a lot about that. And I'm also really big on um, debunking money myths. I know when I was growing up, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. And I remember my mom used to put a note above the toilet paper it's kind of embarrassing to say and she would say only take three (laughs) only take three sheets and I'm like mom and now she says oh it was for environmental reasons but actually I think we didn't have a lot of money you know so a lot of people grow up with whatever stigma associated with money and feel like as I did not worthy of it so when I started my first businesses it was a few years before I actually got comfortable about the notion of making money and now you know I don't I couldn't care less about money in in and of itself, but I freaking love money because it buys platform and freedom and choice. And without it, it's actually very hard to expand and grow and give back and have a voice and create platforms. So, um, yeah, I'm all about money now and it doesn't need to be, you know, mutually exclusive about doing good in the world. So, so that book's about that. And I also recently brought one out, which is a journal to take it one step further which is called know your numbers and in there literally I've put in every single like PL, every single you know spreadsheet cash flow everything that you need to know about because I think what I've seen is way too many women in particular uh be it in their personal life or in business in business they'll be like oh someone else will do like that or you start a business and you think oh it's not going to do much and suddenly as I found it's you know, turning over tens and tens of millions of dollars. And you're like, well, this is very different to a business that, you know, is quite small. And suddenly you really need to have an understanding around this from a cash flow perspective in particular. I mean, that's the undoing of so many businesses 
But also I've seen way too many women who either hang out to get married and think, well, the, the guy will have all the money or they have a partner and then they relinquish control and the partner holds, you know, control of everything. And I really believe, you know, financial independence is key and actually understanding our numbers. And there is, there's a lot of power in getting intimate with your data and it doesn't come naturally to me or a lot of women, but I now love it. And um, my bookkeeper, Kate, has been with me nearly 14 years and there's not a day that goes by that we don't talk and she, you know, is my day-to-day person. And then I have the CFO and accountant and people, but every day we we know exactly what's going on in the business and in my personal life and I think you know I love to talk a lot about stinking thinking around money but you know we talk about being an entrepreneur I say if you have stinking thinking on money being an entrepreneur is not going to come easy because your net worth comes down to your self-worth would you agree with that statement Um, and what do you say to women who have stinking thinking around money feel non-deserving non-worthy think money is not important and yet they're still trying to run and scale a business well it's almost impossible to scale a business without money because I mean I can talk about a myriad of businesses because like you I have had many across multiple different industries you know from (laughs) product product businesses to service businesses but I mean everything for example at the moment um, I just said we're doing like 30 print products this year most of my print bills are around 60 grand so when and we pay upfront now so when you think about that from a cash flow perspective that is a chunk of change (laughs) I need to find and I need to constantly test and iterate and make sure I mean if anyone looks at the products we've bought out this year we're bringing out like mini books at $17.95 journals at $39.95 like a different different product so we're testing all the time but you know I can't really afford to get it wrong too many times because that's a lot of money that's outgoing continuously and then I've got you know, a number of different distribution channels across a number of different countries and geographic locations. So I have got to have my finger on the pulse all the time. And then you take into account, I've got a number of different mortgages. So there's a lot of money moving around continuously. But, you know, for anyone, and I see this a lot with startups, it's like I talk a lot about MOQs and MVPs. So (laughs) minimum order quantities. I mean, so many people are like, I'm going to start a clothing brand and I'm going to have this many, I'm going (laughs) to release with you know 60 items and I'm gonna do but it's always like what is the forget your ego what's the minimum order quantity and even if you have to pay a little bit more per unit initially just to test the market and see if people are actually there you know people will be prepared to wait eight weeks or whatever it is to get product remade and shipped um I think it's good to just you know be careful be a little bit risk averse to start with until you know that there's a market there and people want to buy and the same with you know minimal viable product if it's you know if you're putting out something that's tech or whatever else you know done is better than perfect test the market and then iterate as you go I think way too many people and we all do we get excited when we're going to launch something we'll throw all the money in the world we have into it we bet the house and then if it doesn't work, you know, we've lost a lot of money, time, potential audience. And, you know, and that's when people get frustrated and throw it all away and think, well, I, I'm not a very good business person or I can't do this. And it's like, well, know your numbers, you know, get intimate with your data, be unafraid to learn that side of things as well as the creative side. This is really golden uh, advice here. I come from a manufacturing background as well. Ah. <laughs> so I totally understand, you know, in order for me, I used to be in the health and fitness industry, then into products online, $100,000 a container, started yeah. at 30, then it creeps to 50, then you've got two containers on the water. I know. And then one thing goes wrong or you haven't manufactured properly or you've missed out some, uh, you know, some um, uh, uh, bits and pieces in your information or you haven't it done your quality control properly. Yeah. Oh my and I've God. Seen it. I, I, go ahead. <laughs> I'm bringing back nightmares for you. I've seen it time yes. and time and time again. And the other thing is, whilst I believe business, no matter what industry vertical you're in, you know, follows a certain blueprint, it's also quite different. Like for my books, for example, we print generally at least 10 to 15,000 units per run now because I've got that fairly down pat. I was going to start a, um, 
a pet label this year and I didn't do it for various reasons. But, you know, I was fascinated about fashion and pet accessories that mostly they only do runs of like 200. And I was like, what? How am I going to make the money out of that? I'm used to selling high volume products. So, you know, you've got to just know your industry a little bit and just test things differently until you, as I've done, I mean, I've been publishing things now since 2004. So I'm able to hit you know, print on 10,000, 15,000 products and know that I'm mostly going to get it right. I don't always get it right. There's a product I did last year, which um, normally, you know, we sell a lot and we sold like, I think 18 of this particular journal in a whole month. And I was like, oh, and I'd done um, 10,000 and I was like, oh my God, it's just not moving. Like what a disaster. Now, luckily most of it does move, but you know, I still get it wrong sometimes. So you got to you got to, I think when it comes to money, you've got to know or ask yourself, how much am I prepared to lose? Because you do sometimes. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. And, and, know your, and know know your numbers. You've got to be able to, and still just say if you're manufacturing a product or something, that money is often paid up front in a lot of instances, but you've still got to run a business. You've got to pay staff. You've got to, you know, still operate mm. until the money c- comes back in. And you're talking about sometimes a three month turnaround. Yeah. Um, and, and so, and, you need and I'll just, money. yeah, and I'll add something on that because um, with my printer, it's interesting as well how you can change things counterintuitively. I used to have a 90 day billing cycle with them. So I wouldn't actually pay my printer until 90 days from when my product landed. But that also, so that's actually very good from a cash flow perspective. So by the time I had to pay the bill, I'd actually sold most of the product and broken even. And so it wasn't an issue, but I found that I was getting into an unhealthy cycle. So I've actually chosen to change my billing cycle so that I pay up front so that actually I'm in a much better position. So it's interesting. You play with things and you work it out as you go. But again, it just boils back down to having that healthy relationship with money and understanding that money is just that exchange of value. I just see it as a, a flow yeah. of the value and the service that you bring to people. Let's talk about how important it is behind your brand, but to have a mission associated with that, because there's days where we hit the dirt in business. I've hit the dirt many times, lost a lot of money, made a lot of money. And, you know, without the mission or the soul, uh, the soulful mission, I don't think I could get up and keep going. Do you yeah. feel that it's important to be aligned in it with a mission over just having a business trying to make money? Uh, <laughs> if, <laughs> yes. If you are in it just, just to make money, it will not work. Like I, I really believe that. So I do a lot of speaking to a lot of people and whenever I'm speaking to corporates in particular, I talk about, you know, really understanding what's your purpose, what's your why. And for me personally, it's to be an entrepreneur for entrepreneurs, living my life out loud, showing that anything's possible. That's what keeps me accountable on a daily basis. It's my litmus test when someone comes at me and says, do you want to do a doggy brand? You know, it took me a little while to work that out. And then I was like, no, it's not on purpose. Um, And for Collective Hub, it's three words, igniting human potential. And the thing is, when you have that, then it gives you a precision focus. But beneath that, I find you're able to morph, pivot, iterate change according to the market. So that means, and I said earlier, you know, we really have print digital and events, three main pillars that sit underneath. But in the instance of 2020, when COVID hit, you know, and the event side of the business and a lot of my in-person speaking dried up, we were able to quickly pivot into our digital and um, print platforms and really turn that on. So it's almost like future-proofing. But I talk to people about having a purpose, you know, really knowing what you want to do for your community, what you stand for, and then being able to kind of move within that and be quite fluid because, you know, the economy, everything's taught us this year more than ever that it's really important. And too many businesses, I take, say, Kodak as an example, if they really thought about what's the feeling that we want our customers to um, feel when they interact with our brand on any platform, they might not have been so attached to the specific product or the specific delivery mechanism and they might not have, you know, 
floundered or gone under. Whereas when people can move and adapt, I think that's really good. So, and it's interesting having, you know, owned a magazine and media business and interviewed not myself personally, but my team over 6,000 people over the years. Um, it's extraordinary how many people, and you would have this all the time, PRs who pitched you and they're like, here, can you do a story on this? And I always go back to, well, that's great. Let's just agree that the product's great. But what do you stand for? Like, what's your mission? What are you trying to do in the world? What are you trying to make a difference? What's your thought leadership piece? So, yeah, I think it's really, really important. Yeah, and having a having a cause bigger than yourself, I find, has truly impacted my life because there's some days where I just don't feel like doing it and then I think, oh, well, why am I doing this? And who am I robbing if I don't get out of bed and face the, the pothole that's faced me today or the hurdle that it seems too high to get over because that's what entrepreneurialism is all around is all about there's no one side there's no straight line yeah <laughs> it is a roller coaster every day and, that, and that's it Amanda sometimes you just think why 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 would I keep doing this like you know when something comes at you you think too hard and that's the thing I always think you know who am I not to? Like there's a community of people who look to me and my brand. And so I think, come on, use this as a, you know, a lesson. What can I actually take from this? How can I impart that lesson to other people? And, you know, just come on, girl, keep going. And that's the thing. We have to have something bigger than ourselves sometimes to keep us going. Because sometimes, as you said earlier, it's easier just to pull the doona up and think, nah, not today. <laughs> Oh, Lisa, I'll, I'll admit to you straight up front, I think, why can't I just be normal? Why can't I just pick an easy road and let somebody else worry about it? Well, it wasn't my pathway. And, um, you know, every day I just think about the people, the, the, the women that we want to shine a light on, you know, getting to have these conversations with uh, entrepreneurial women like yourself who have had such an impact on the world in so many different ways. This is what keeps my lights on and, and keeps me, inspired each and every day and just on that along your pathway to where you are now how important has mentorship been to you and do you believe you'd be where you are without mentors Yes, it's a great question. Thank you. But firstly, I just want to acknowledge you because the work that you do is so selfless. And yeah, and I really appreciate you shining light on amazing women as well, because yeah, it's a big, a big role. So thank you. Keep on doing what you're doing. Thank so you. mentorship's an interesting one because uh, I probably answer it in a way that people don't often expect. Because I think a lot of people think, well, particularly when I started out when I was younger people were like, oh, who's your mentor? And people sometimes still say that. And I have a whole gamut of mentors because I feel like the older you get, the wiser, more experienced you get. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's unlikely that one person is going to be able to give me or help me and support me in every aspect of my life and business that I need. And so I draw on a heap of people. So, um, you know, at the moment I would say Toddy, my trainer, is a mentor to me. I mean, I yes. see him four times a week. He's like getting me fit and strong and, you know, I'm loving that journey. Um, you know, I also have a number of different people in the holistic health space who really mentor me and support me from a nutritional perspective, a gut perspective, uh, you know, because I really believe a lot of that is imperative to running a good business and staying clear. Yes. Um, then I've got like hard ass people like a guy, Jeff, who's um on my advisory board who has, you know, a lot of way bigger businesses than me. So if something really tricky, you know, financial or legal touch would nothing like that has happened for a while. But, you know, I will say, Jeff, you know, help. And straight away he diffuses it because straight away he's like he would have had something 100 times bigger and 100 times worse. And so straight away he gives me perspective and he just gives me a really linear path to be like boom, boom, boom. Um, yeah, so I have a, a lot of different people. I also have, you know, extraordinary circles of women and men who I meet up with regularly for, you know, dinners and we talk and we share openly. So I do believe in surrounding yourself with, you know, mentors and a number of people who can guide you according to their specific field of experience is really, really important. Yeah, it's just beautifully said. And I'm, I'm like you, I have a, a 
a big bunch of different mentors. And as you grow and go along your pathway as an entrepreneur, you'll have many different mentors that cross your path. And I, I always, I had a mentor that once said to me that pay once, cry once. In other words, invest in yourself, you're worth it. Because yeah. we can shave years off the journey, yeah. And, uh, and I and I've just loved that, and I've really stuck to that my whole my whole career, or well, my whole journey as an entrepreneur as hey well. Once, cry once. I like that. Yeah, yeah. Because so many women think that I don't need to invest in myself or my business education. I can get it all off the Google for free. And I'm thinking, girlfriend. <laughs> It's just not worth it. I, I go, who's got the result that I'm looking for? Yeah. Whether it's health and fitness or personal stuff or business, yeah. I'm going to pay once, cry once and save myself some of the pain I know they went through. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, I could not agree more. And, and you know, coming back to that, in investing in self-development and education, I mean, at the time sometimes, and I've been there where you think, oh, that's so much money or whatever, and each and every time I've been like, oh, what I took away from it is just so much bigger and so worth it. Yeah. Oh, yes. On with you. So, Lisa, do you have any other words of encouragement or advice or something that you've learned along the way that you would love to share with our beautiful women following? And I know that they will love this conversation. It's been gold. But what would be your parting words for someone watching this who wants to be successful as you are? Oh, thanks, Amanda. I, I would really say start with purpose. Like it's the most important thing. I know whenever I've done something that's not aligned with my purpose, um, it just doesn't work. So I would say, and, and for people who are saying, well, how do I find my purpose? I think just look for what excites you, what makes you want to get out of bed every day, what makes you feel alive. So I think, you know, and sometimes just write down a big um, ideas soup, I call it, you know, dump it all down and go, these are the things. And then I go, um, and when you start listening to people around you, sometimes they're like, oh, Amanda, you're such a beautiful connector or Amanda, you're so great at this. And then you start listening and you go, oh, some of those actually overlay with what really excites me. And then I go and then look for some commercial you know, potential. So actually will people buy the thing or is it just a good hobby to have? And I think that's a really simple way to start. And so start with purpose, um, surround yourself with a great team, know that you don't have to do it all yourself, I think is really important, hire your weaknesses. And then I would say just fail fast, fail off and fail fast, make value your friend because it's only through failing and I fail. I fail every day in some way, shape or another, but I, that's how I learn. I, <laughs> I test things, I fail, I go, oh, that didn't work. I'll try something different. So be unafraid to fail. Destigmatize that I think is really important. Beautiful. And for, for women who want to follow you more, find out more about what Lisa's up to next, where do we go to? Well, if you just go to Collective Hub or Lisa Messenger across any social platform, you'll find us or collectivehub.com <laughs> collective has all our books, journals, products, tools. So, yeah, go check that out. Or my podcast, Hear Me Raw, R-A-W on Spotify or iTunes. So, yeah, I'm around. <laughs> oh, I love that. I like to talk about real, raw, relatable too, and I think that that's why we've hit it off so well. Lisa's got hundreds uh -huh. of of followers on social she's doing some great stuff and if I may ask you one final question Lisa what specifically would you love to be known and remembered for I think just uh helping to lift others higher showing people that anything is possible and yeah living living a full whole life full of joy <laughs> Yeah, so, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's been an absolute delight and uh, thank you so much for being part of the Millionaires Movement. You're an integral part of, I call it the butterfly effect. You know, this message will live on for years. This is living our legacy and leaving our legacy and I just so appreciate your time. It's been a delight and I have just love your energy and your groundness. Uh, so thank uh. you. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a beautiful conversation, beautiful connection. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And I hope we get to meet in person someday soon. There's no reason why not. You're running down the road. I know, exactly. Oh, thank you. Well, let me know when, when this is going live and um, I'll share it across our platforms as well. 
Thank you so much. And if you're ever on, in the Queensland or in the GC, I'll send you a little message. Please reach out. We'll go out and have a cup of tea and have a good old laugh about life and uh, business. And um, who knows? We'll, I'm sure we'll meet again. Yeah, thank you. And did we send you some books and things? Did you send me your, have you got, send me your address? Oh, that, would ask- be, that might have been um, the publishing side. I'll, I'll ask them. Yeah, send me your address and I'll send you a whole lot of books and things as well. So, oh, yeah. what a gorgeous lady. Thank you so much, beautiful. You enjoy the rest of your day. And again, thank it's been you. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Bye.